Well, good morning. I want to set up an idea. It's March. March into April is historically, around the world, Easter season. It's a lot of other things. March is significant for us. It's springtime begins. Other parts of the world, fall begins. Daylight saving time happens for us. There's something that happens down in the United States called March Madness. Does anyone <laughs> know what that might be referring to? Anyone at all? Sports. Sports? What kind? Basketball. Specifically? college men's and women's basketball so imagine I have a basketball right now if I don't do this it, but I rather do this what is that called a pass a pass we're in church so I need to be honest and tell you that for about three years of my life I was really into the red green show <laughs> and just before the 300th episode, the final episode, my wife bought me a ticket and invited a whole bunch of friends and we all went to be in the live studio audience. I think it was show 270 of 300 then. I, we had to hand this in and I got mine back because I wanted it as a keepsake. But what is this called? It's a ticket, but what's it also called? A pass, different kind of pass. In 2017, Karen and I had the trip of a lifetime for us. We went on a motorcycle trip through the Great Smoky Mountains of Virginia and North Carolina. And we went through many crevices through the mountains called mountain passes, another kind of pass. This weekend, this Sunday, my wife and I have to get back to a couple who invited us to go with them and a whole group of people on a trip to Israel. And they even said, we, will pay, we want you to come so much, we'll pay $2,000 toward the trip. We said, that is very generous of you. How much is the whole trip for the two of us? 11,000. <laughs> so, so we told our oldest son, Jay, and he said, I can do that trip. We'll do it together for a whole lot cheaper. I said, we don't want to sleep, sleep in David's cave of Adullam. <laughs> what will this cheap trip to Israel cost us? So he's working on that. But we have to get back to this couple on Sunday, and we'll probably say we're going to pass. We're going to pass. So many different meanings. Maybe you've had a job interview, a company you're not working for, or maybe within your own company. And after the interview, you said, I'll take a pass. Or maybe they said they would take a pass. And maybe some of us have been passed over for uh, a promotion. So, and there's other meanings for pass. There's just so many. But the Bible, early out of the gate, talks about a pass. In fact, the second book of the Bible talks about a pass. Anyone know what it's called? The pass over the pass over. For those who don't know, whether online or here in person, just very briefly, the children of Israel had gone down into Egypt and they've been there now for over 400 years. In the last number of years, it has been very difficult. They're slaves in Egypt. But God has said, I want my people out of Egypt. Let my people go was what Moses said to the king, Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said, no, I'm not letting them go. And so God to convince Pharaoh to let them go, sent how many plagues? 10 plagues on Israel. And three times, it did change Pharaoh's heart, and he said they can go, but then he changed his heart, his heart was hardened, and he said, no, they can't go. And finally, the 10th plague was the worst of all, the death of the firstborn son. From Pharaoh on the throne to the poorest slave in the, in the country, to every member of the livestock even. The firstborn male was to be put to death. And you know, I don't know what you think about that, but that seems extremely harsh. I mean, the Nile turning to blood, frogs, you know, all the di different things that have the flies, 
pretty horrible, but now we're talking about the death of an innocent child. Pretty harsh. I got thinking about that this past week, but you know, Egypt had nine opportunities to repent and say to the children of Israel they could go. And Pharaoh had ordered the death of every male Hebrew child previously, right, when Moses was born. And so this was a time of God's manifest judgment. It was like an eye for an eye, and it was very manifest. And that was just the time that they were in. But God provided a way out. Do you remember what the way out was? They could take a lamb, one-year-old male lamb without defect, and they could put it to death and take the blood and apply it on the frame and the upper frame and the side frames of a door. And here's what God said. Here's what God said. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. I will pass over you. That was for Jewish people. That was for non-Jewish people. That was for everybody. They equally had that opportunity. You and I are just like those Egyptians. We are deserving of death. We are every one of those firstborns. But Good Friday is about God extending his mercy. God extending his grace. But only if he sees the blood, the lamb's blood, applied to our lives, then he will pass over us. And that's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians 5 and 7, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. That's where we're going this morning. That's the lead in to our time of worship. That's the lead in to the message that's going to follow. We're going to think about Jesus, our Passover, and the fact that it took his blood for God to have mercy on us. This Easter weekend, something always so special about it, and we're going to look at Good Friday that changes everything, and then on Sunday, the second half of the story, the Easter Sunday that changes everything. But let's begin with Good Friday. I want to ask you a question, and I'd like you to feel free to answer out loud. Um, what do the communion elements represent? And by that, I mean both the bread and the wine taken together as a whole. Right. So the death of Jesus, his body, his blood. So specifically the bread speaks of his body, his body and the cup of wine or juice, his blood. When Jesus and his disciples arrived for the meal where all this happened, did the bread that they ate and the wine that they drank represent this, what we just said, or something else. See, Jesus changed everything about the meal they were about to have. Look what it says in Luke 22, verse 14. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles, so the 12 apostles, reclined at the table, and he, Jesus, said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover. So they're eating Passover, what we just talked about earlier. I eagerly desire to eat this with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. So again, what was the original setting here? Passover. The Exodus 12 experience from 1700 years ago. That's what they're doing at this moment. But look what it says, verse 17. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. May I suggest, though, that this cup in verse 17 is not the communion cup. 
we will see the communion cup in a few more verses. So there's, there's nothing earth shattering here, right? He just takes a cup. He, he says, everyone have a drink of it. Divides it among them. Keep reading. Verse 19. Then he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them saying, this is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And I think at that moment, the disciples started doing one of these. What is he saying? What is he doing? That's not what this cup means, that this bread means. Remember our theme, Good Friday changes everything. Jesus is about to change the meaning of things. First, the bread. The bread of the Passover, unlike our bread today, was unleavened bread. Um, in fact, Karen said, be careful when you put it in the oven. Don't shake it too much because there's yeast in it and it won't rise. But the original Passover bread didn't have yeast in it. Why? Because the Israelites were in a big hurry to eat that bread and to get out of Egypt. We're told that specifically in Deuteronomy 16.3. They were to eat it with haste. And so there was no time for the bread to rise even. So don't add any yeast. But the Passover bread was actually called something. It was called the bread of affliction the bread of affliction. Now, every one of the four Gospels accounts, accounts says that Jesus took the bread, gave thanks for it. Two times it says he blessed it, similar idea, and he broke the bread. And the, the disciples, the apostles, are observing this very carefully, what he's doing. And I believe Jesus adds this visual aid to the new meaning of the Passover in the act of breaking the bread. Let's come back to the breaking in a moment. But look what he says. It's highlighted and underscored here. This is my body given for you. Now, this is so familiar to us, right? We've heard this many, many times. But this was a radical idea to the Jewish ears who were listening. They have, the Jewish people have kept the Passover unchanged for 1,700 years. And now, what is he saying? This is my body. Do you know what Jesus was saying? He was saying, this bread of affliction foreshadows the affliction that's coming. My affliction. This is my body given for you. Then he says, do this in remembrance of me. This is beyond what's, what's about to happen in the next 24 hours. Right? He's looking down through the centuries to today. Do this in remembrance of me. Good Friday changes everything. Next, the cup of wine. Look at verse 20. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Again, the disciples had to have been looking at each other. What did he just say? What is he doing? This is my blood? As a Passover cup of wine, what did this cup represent? Because we saw a different cup in verse 17, didn't we? He, he gave them a cup, he divided it, but this is another cup. Well, truth be told, if you look on the screen, there are one, two, three, four different cups of wine in a Passover meal or called the Passover Seder. They represent each of the four promises that God made to his people in Exodus 6, 6 to 7. And so the question is, which of the four cups did he take and what did they represent? Okay, so the first cup, verse 6 of Exodus 6, I am the Lord and I will bring you out from under the yoke of the Egyptians. It's called the Kiddush cup. To this day, it's called that. And that Hebrew word means sanctification. I will take you out. I will separate you from your slavery in Egypt. I will set you apart. And so it's the cup of sanctification. And they would have drank that. The second cup, verse 6b, I will free you from being slaves to them. Called the Megid cup, the cup of praise. We're going to be free. And then the third cup, I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with mighty acts of judgment. 
the plagues in Egypt, the Red Sea experience, that whole thing. And that cup was called the Birkat Hazaman cup. It's still called that to this day in a Passover Seder. It means the cup of redemption. And then the fourth cup, I will take you as my own people and I will be your God. And that's called the, cup, the halal cup or the cup of acceptance, I will take you. But it's also called the, the cup of anticipation because I will be your God. Isn't that amazing? I will bring you out. I will free you. I will redeem you, which means to purchase you and set you, you free. And I will take you as my own and be your God. Well, which one of those cups do you think Jesus took and changed its meaning? Scholars are convinced that Jesus changed the third cup. The third cup, the cup of redemption. How appropriate, right? How appropriate. Just as the bread of affliction is going to foreshadow the cross, so the cup of redemption will be the result of the cross. He's going to set his people free by paying this, this huge price for us. Well, that is exactly why Paul the Apostle, who is also a highly trained Jewish scholar, wrote, for indeed Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Listen, when you read the story of the Passover in Exodus 12, that is this. That Passover lamb's body is this lamb of God's body. That Passover lamb's blood is this Lord's Supper's lamb of God's blood. That is this. So in a sense, Jesus didn't change the meaning or adapt the meaning. He completed the meaning. He filled it out. It was all pointing to him. It was all pointing to him. And that is why this moment on Good Friday ought to move us and ought to stir us so deeply. Why? Because it's about us. It's about us. It's about you and I. Can I be transparent and tell you that two things have stirred me this Easter season in a new and profound way, thoughts that I'd never had before. And the first is this, the manner of Jesus' death. He could have received poison and died relatively instantly and relatively painlessly, but he didn't. He could have been hung until he died. He could have been beheaded or speared. All of those awful, right? But all so much more quick and less painful. But why did God choose to come at a time when the manner and to a place where the manner of death for a criminal was crucifixion? The Assyrians began crucifixion, but the Romans perfected it. And it was known for two big things. Crucifixion was known for this. Number one, it was about humiliation. Most of the pictures we see, they have something in their midsection, not how a crucifixion happened. A person was nailed to that cross naked for the public to see. It was maximum humiliation. But secondly, excruciation. In that word excruciate is the word crux or cross. It was the worst form of pain imaginable. Why would our God do that? In the reading that Rob read, it got at it. What's the deepest pain that you have ever experienced? Don't say it out loud, but just think about it. What's the deepest pain you've ever experienced? Jesus understands. He feels what you felt. In fact, he felt it with you. And he has felt deeper pain than anything we've ever felt. Well, that has really gripped me in a new way this, Christ, this Easter season. But secondly, only Jesus 
can turn a crucifixion into a celebration. Because that's what he's doing here in the Lord's Supper. The words of Jesus at the table, think about it, they're all pointing to the future, aren't they? They're pointing to the immediate near future of his awful, horrible, excruciating death. But beyond that, they're pointing to the continual remembrance of him when his church, his bride, gathers together the way we are this morning, sharing communion, sharing the Lord's Supper. But listen to me for a moment. Jesus is looking even further into the future beyond us at this moment. Look back on the screen here at what he says in verse 15 and 16. I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover meal with you before I suffer, for I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And then verse 18, for I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Do you know what Jesus is saying here? When he completed the meaning of the Passover bread of affliction, and when he completed the meaning of the third cup of the Passover, the cup of redemption, this is my body, this is my blood, he is laying down a brand new revelatory prophecy that one day, when the kingdom of God is fully revealed, I will eat again, and I will drink again this meal. What in the world is he talking about? Well, here's what he's talking about. You have to go to the last book of the Bible to see it. Revelation chapter 19. Now, John, this is all future, but John is seeing this prophetic revelation, and so it's like it's happening right in front of him. And he, so he says, Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder, kind of an ominous setting, shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Then the angel said to me, to John, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the lamb. And that is when Jesus is going to then eat again the bread and drink the wine. And those who know him will be there with him, doing it as well. How do you feel about toasts at weddings and special events? You know, I know some people I've talked to and they're like, I love those toasts. And other people are like, oh, it's such a waste of time, those toasts. And, uh, and other people are just ambivalent. I think that's where I would be maybe with it. But uh, a few weeks ago, Lisa and Jean and I, we went to the memorial of Wendy Campbell, who was the, the, the big boss at the food bank, and she passed away, young woman in her 50s. And uh, we were sitting at a table with a lady, and we had offered to get her a drink of anything, water, what, anything, but she didn't want anything. And, but when it came time, there was many toasts to Wendy. And, and when it came time to toast, this lady would just hold up her hand like this and go around the table cheer. I was like, okay, okay. But, I reached out to our resident researcher in our family, our oldest son, Jay, who has a subscription to a, like a high-level version of AI, and I said, Jay, what's up with toasts and, and raising a glass, and what's that all about? Do you know that it dates back all the way to the sixth century before Christ? To the Greeks and the Romans, they would offer libations up to the gods. But then it morphed and it became a drinking to each other's health as a sign of honor and goodwill. And then when Emperor Augustus was on the throne, every meal you had to raise a glass to the emperor. So that's where it all started. Well, where did the whole toast thing come from? Literally, the Roman practice was placing a burnt piece of toast <laughs> into drinks to improve the flavor by reducing acidity. I mean, try it if you want to. I won't be anytime soon. By the 18th century, the term had shifted from actual toast in the drink to a person being honored by the toast, leading to phrases like the toast of the town for particularly popular individuals such as Ed and Kathleen, <laughs> right? They're coming up next month on their 70th wedding anniversary. So, so, 
so we would, we would toast them, toast them for that. Well, I don't know what your picture of the wedding supper of the Lamb is like. But as ornate as that is, that's not big enough. That's not big enough. And I've kind of pictured it outdoors like that, and maybe it's like that, but then I looked at those chairs. Those chairs are way too cheap. <laughs> way too cheap. So we have no idea. We have no idea. But that's kind of my favorite. This endless, endless, endlessly long table where God's people are gathered. And can we use our imaginations for just a moment as we close? Can you imagine the toasts at the marriage supper of the Lamb? Abraham raises a glass. And he says, I'd like to propose a toast to the man who called me when I was a nobody from nowhere. Who when I was a very old man who would never father a child, he told me that he would bring a nation from me. And he did. He changed everything to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can you identify with Abraham? Have you ever felt like you were no one from nowhere? He changes everything about your story. And then Esther, she stands up and she raises a glass and she says, a toast to the man who saw me in the middle of an impossible situation when I thought God had abandoned me and my people. And I learned that just because he was silent, it didn't mean he was absent. He was always there. He was always with me and he was always for me. He changed everything to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you identify with Esther? Have you ever been in an impossible situation where you feel, felt actually abandoned by God? He was with you. He is with you. He is for you. Samson. Samson raises a glass. A toast to the man who saw me when I was so full of myself and so full of lust and self-ambition. And despite who I was, he empowered and used me to achieve impossible victories. But because everywhere I went, there I was, I lost my eyes due to my pride. But he still loved me. And he changed everything. And in fact, he gave me the greatest victory of my life on my very last day on earth to the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Can you identify with Samson? Have you been trapped in self-ambition, in pride, maybe in lust, in sin? He changes everything. He can change everything about that. And then David. King David raises a glass. I'd like to propose a toast to the Lamb of God who found me in a sheep pen in the middle of a field. And as messed up as I was, and I can see David stopping and looking down the table and saying, Uriah, I see you at the table. You know how sorry I've been that I sent you here before your time. But the Lamb of God, he raised me up to become this famous king in the world, but I am nothing compared to the king of all kings and the Lord of all lords. He changed everything about my life. Can you identify with David? Can you identify with him? Maybe you've done things that you thought God would never, could never forgive you for. But his blood when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Just a few more. The woman at the well. The woman at the well raises a glass. Most of you have no idea what my name is. But I propose a toast to the man who met me when I was chasing hard after lies. Believing that my identity and significance and purpose was found in being loved by a man. Six husbands later, I was empty and thirsty, embarrassed and ashamed of who I'd become. But you know what? He wasn't. 
he wasn't. There is no man like him. He changed everything to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can you identify with the woman at the well? Hey, last one. Peter. Peter raises a glass. Well, I just have to say something. It's what I do. <laughs> a toast to the man who found me when I wasn't looking for him. He called me when I didn't believe I was worthy to follow him. He blessed me when I didn't ask him to. And he loved me when I didn't deserve it. He changed everything. So ladies and gentlemen, raise a glass to my greatest and best friend, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Can you identify with Peter? You and I don't deserve to be called the friend of Jesus, but he calls us friends. He calls us family. There's going to be a lot of wine at the marriage supper of the Lamb because the toasts are going to go on and on and on and on for a very long time. Why? Because Good Friday changes everything. Has it changed you? Has Jesus changed you? As we go to the table, the thing that is common about every person that will offer a toast at the marriage supper of the Lamb is this, that each one of them has personally been forgiven of their sins. Each one of them have heard the words of God, when I saw the blood of Jesus applied to your life, I passed over you and I will pass over you. This morning, if you are in that place of safety and security in Jesus, where the blood has been applied, where you've received him as your Lord and Savior, where you've repented of your sins and received him, you're invited to come to this table and share these elements. If you have not done that, there is both no shame in just sitting where you are but there is also a judgment in coming to the table. Scripture actually talks about that. So if you don't know Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, then feel free to just sit and observe. All right? When I see the blood, I will pass over you. Sincerely, invite him into your life so that you can know that he's passed over you. Let's pray. Let's pray. God, the old poem says, only bread and only wine, yet to faith the solemn sign of the heavenly and divine, we give you thanks, O Lord. God, we receive this bread and we receive this juice and fully acknowledge that it represents the body and the life's blood of Jesus, our Savior. God, we acknowledge that he's changed everything in our lives. And we anticipate one day sitting down at that table at the marriage supper of the Lamb, having been invited because of the transaction of salvation that happened here on earth. God, thank you for the hope that is before us. But thank you right now for this moment where we get to celebrate him in this way. God, we, we come to this table and we receive these precious gifts because they represent his precious gift of himself. In Jesus' name, amen.